Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Kimberly Griffiths, Curator of Education at the Everson Museum of Art. Uh, tonight, I am excited to welcome you to our new Everson Up Close Artist Series, inspired by our new exhibition, Who, What, When, Where, which is open now at the Everson. Tonight's talk, entitled A Different Kind of Mission, brings together artist Erin Toole and our special guest, Omar Columbus, who is a poet, writer, photographer, and US Air Force veteran. Before we get into our discussion, I just wanted to be sure you're aware of some of our exhibitions and programs. So the museum is open to the public and here are hours. We're open Thursday through Sunday. We have opened up several new exhibitions, including Who, What, When, Where, uh, the title of which is inspired by the um, artwork by Carrie Mae Weems that you see here. That's on view through August 22nd. Also on view is an exhibition by artist Jaleel Campbell called Homecoming. And Jaleel is a Syracuse native, incredible artist. Um, also on view on our lower level is the Floating Bridge um, Postmodern Contemporary Japanese Ceramics, which is on view through July. And then be sure to check out our other um, artist series. Our next talk will be this Sunday, May 2nd with David McDonald. Um, and we'll also speak with Ellen Blaylock, Don Williams Boyd, Peter B. Jones, Carrie Mae Weems to end out our series. Please also join us next Thursday for a very fun um, series that we're calling Salt and Pepper in partnership with the Salt City Market. And we will get to hear about art, food, um, family stories. Um, it's just a lot of fun, a half an hour with um, Vanessa Johnson, who is a storyteller and artist um, living in Syracuse and Slay, who is the owner of a restaurant called Solution. So that's uh, Thursday, May 6th at 6 p.m. We have a lot of outdoor programs um, kicking up again since the nicer weather is hitting central New York. So join us for City Market, May through October on the second Sunday of each month. And Food Truck Fridays are starting up again um, next Friday, which is really exciting. So um, now I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, um, Garth Johnson. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Garth Johnson, the Paul Phillips and Sharon Sullivan Curator of Ceramics at the Everson. And it's my great, great pleasure to have Omar and Aaron joining us tonight. Um, so Aaron is a very, very special person when it comes to, look at that, we've got it going, Aaron. Uh, to the ceramics community and in all of the institutions where I've been a curator, um, Aaron has always been at the top of my list of people that I know can come in um, and make work that will connect with the public uh, in a certain way. Um, through Aaron and through teaching in the California Community College system, um, I got to really know veterans as they returned from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I became a sort of huge believer um, in uh, all of the things that uh, uh, the veterans in my life have done after they've gotten back from serving. And Aaron is the person that I call when I have a really crazy idea of uh, you know some large thing to pull off. When I was at the Clay Studio in Philadelphia, Aaron came and worked for 40 hours straight, more or less, with uh, another veteran in the galleries um, throwing cups. Um, I've gone to the VA hospital in Phoenix uh, with Aaron. We sat outside of the Starbucks giving away cups because no one at the Veterans Administration in Phoenix would uh, put their ass on the line enough to let us do anything else really. But I watched Aaron connect with person after person um, and those people came to my museum and got to see his show afterwards. Um, Aaron is a magic person in terms of being able to connect with people of um, all sorts of belief systems and uh, all sorts of walks of life and uh, um, uh, never never pulls his punches and somehow he does it all by just making cups. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Toole. <laughs> 
I thought we were going to do Omar next. So yeah. are we going to bring on Omar right away? <laughs> Let him off the hook. <laughs> are you ready, Omar? OK, so Omar, our uh, poet and veteran, is going to share a spoken word piece, piece with us. Thank you, Omar. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Kimberly, and thank you, Garth. Thank you, everybody at uh, Emerson Museum. I really appreciate this opportunity, and I'm so excited to be able to just do anything with Aaron, too. He is awesome. He is magical. Uh, his cups are conversation starters, uh, and I'm grateful that to have my own cup. He heard one of my poems this year, and he actually created a cup from, my, from being inspired by my poem, and I just want him to know he inspires me so much. Uh, everybody, my name is Omar Columbus. Uh, I served on active duty in the Air Force for 12 years with deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, upon returning home from service, I realized that I had was challenged with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I found art therapy to be an outlet for my symptoms. And I started getting involved with uh, an organization called Poetic Theater Productions. And they have a, a group that they call their Veteran Voices. And I'm a co-facilitator for their Veteran Voices writing programs. Uh, we use uh, warrior cultures of the past, such as the Greeks, Romans, and Native Americans. They welcome their military warriors home in rituals of storytelling. Uh, what we do with Veteran Voices is we follow that tradition and try to create a modern interpretation of homecoming for all veterans that served whether home or abroad. And the Veteran Voices program is designed to cultivate a thriving and compassionate environment for veterans and the family members of veterans to speak their truths and to share their experiences as we bear witness together. Uh, this is a poem I created recently. It's entitled, Camouflaged Heart. War makes humans human. Conflict is universal. From the beginning, there was war. Before I was born and lifetimes afar. Battles rage as mankind ages, yet never learns from past mistakes or from stories of those who live to tell of what war remains, a living hell. I had never been more present than at that very moment. Standing in a desert land, hearing a foreign language I could not understand. Camouflaged, dressed so that I could blend in. Desensitized to suffering and pain, only a camouflaged heart remained. A predator drone loitered above, waiting to dehumanize the enemy. With my weapon in hand, encircled by sand, requesting a drone strike, reports of Taliban. Drone sights locked on to an evading man, left his truck in the sand, and away he ran. But with crosshairs locked on, the moving target engaged, the coordinates called in, hellfire missiles rained. Dust and blood splattered then settled, my life forever changed. It's the things you can't see that hurt me the most. Only a camouflaged heart remained. I'm no longer a warrior, a veteran, seeking renewal and transitioning to peace. Still, dreams of war knock at my door. I try not to let them in. They invade, they conquer, 
they win. My willingness to do whatever to live outweighed my fear to die. Searching for weapons of mass destruction turned out to be a fucking lie. The guilt that comes from surviving, isolating, comrades did not make it back alive. Hyperventilating, my nightmares evolve into daymares. No one sees, no one cares. What I've experienced, what I've done. Once an asset, now a liability. Medicate the veteran, keep him numb. In a country broken into pieces, Currently, I see no peace. Constantly worried about mankind because the next man may not be kind. I deployed in defense of a nation and returned home to unemployment and discrimination. For walking while black, I've been stopped and frisked racial profiling, the determination. I went from military to civilian, lost in translation. My world flipped upside down, forced reintegration. I was prior discipline, now post-stressed, deteriorated motivation. As I watch elected officials continually disrespect America's veteran services, oh, the ultimate humiliation. And after 12 years of honorable service, I wake up daily, a black man in America, feeling nervous. And yes, I'm still in pain. You just can't see it because only a camouflaged heart remains. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Omar, for sharing that. All right, Erin, are you ready? Yeah, right on. Yeah, uh, you know, I was going to say, um, Grayson Perry was saying that pots aren't a good way to communicate. And I think just in general, that uh, communication, especially about important things like war and racism and death and things is always kind of a failed, uh, it's, never gonna, it's never gonna happen, right? Wars, the Greeks did all this great work <laughs> a thousand years ago and still we have war. So I don't, I don't really have a lot of hope in communication about the most important things, but that was a pretty powerful <laughs> poem right there. Also, like I resisted the idea of art as therapy. When I started, right, I wanted to be a big A artist. I didn't start doing craft or anything like that. I wanted to make, uh, art, but um, wow, I totally lost my. <laughs> but I think, and so, but now I, I, you know, like what twenty something years into it, I do realize that that art has been a therapy. But I think more than you know, sitting at the wheel and making the work, or um, that it's the, the community of artists that have been the greatest um, help for me and and moving forward. That kind of camaraderie we had in the Marine Corps isn't a thing in the civilian world. You know, I, I got out of the Marine Corps and wanted to do something above crass commercial uh, garbage, but turns out there isn't much in the civilian world that is above it. Um, on a side note too there, I, I was gonna try not to swear. So I made this little, uh, so when, when I wanna drop the F word, this may be in the, <laughs> in the talk. I wanted to give a disclaimer saying that Everson and Garth weren't responsible for any swearing or anything I did, but I realized that like a lot of like the opinions and things I share may not even be my own. That like this whole thing of like giving the cups away might actually be a Coca-Cola commercial from the 70s, right? I want to buy, buy the world the Coke and keep it company. That might be the whole thing. So 
I would uh, encourage folks to think about the things they, they think <laughs> and the beliefs they have and, and question if they're really their own. All right, so now I'll start the PowerPoint. Geez, that's a lot of face in the screen there. Uh, share screen. Yes, uh-oh, what happened there? That one? <laughs> eee. Technology, is that working? That's terrifying. Not oh. yet. We're okay, not yet. hit the share button. What? Are you kidding me? Screen sharing has failed to start. Please try again later. All right, let me, I can share my screen. Oh my gosh. And you just tell me uh, when to go to the next image. All right. Wow. All right, so I'm going to try to go kind of quick. Are you, is that, oh, it shut me up. Yeah, yeah, but I'm looking at my PowerPoint, which. How do I get my damn? All right, so you can see that. All right. Yeah, so, right, people are like, how'd you go from the Marine Corps to UC Berkeley? Yeah, it was difficult. I was part of this loving organization. Now I'm part of this fascist backstabbing academic cluster. It's been difficult. All right, next. And that's actually the UC radiological lab detonating that bomb and then had the soldiers walk through. I'm the kiln fairy at UC Berkeley, the senior laboratory mechanician. All right, next. Uh, I help the students with uh, loading kilns and firing kilns. I'm not a professor, so I don't have to profess. It's just technical assistance, which is uh, a lot less stressful, I think. All right, next. Yeah, um, my boss, Stephanie Sihuko, called me a unicorn once, staff and a working artist. My son thought that was funny, so I've been collecting unicorn stuff since then. All right, next. Cups, I make cups. Next. All right, I've made and given away more than 22,000 since 2001. Next. Boy. Played football in high school. Manual Arts was my home school in sunny South Central there. This was uh, Fairfax High School I was bused to. It was a much nicer school. All right, next. Uh, my grandfather was in the Marine Corps. Next. Father was in the Army. Next. I was in the Marine Corps. You can go back and forth a little bit. They say we look similar. I don't see it myself, but I don't know. That's actually me, 100 pounds ago. Well, maybe 120 pounds ago. All right, next. Uh, that's during the day, during the oil fires in the 91 Gulf War. All right. And I came home and my gas mask that I wore and the chemical protection detection kit was a toy. Next. For children ages five and up. I mean, how are you going to describe to a five-year-old what mustard gas or nerve gas does to somebody? All right, next. Came back, it was a video game. Yeah, next. It was not a game. Next. After the Gulf War, I volunteered for embassy duty, had two hardship posts back-to-back, -back. Rome for 15 months, and then Paris for 15 months. This is Rome. I think I got that guy beat. I think my ears are a little bigger than his. All right, next. Then got out, uh, went to a community college. The idea was to go to school, find something I'd like to do because I'd like to do it, I'll do it well. Because I do it well, someone will pay me. The pay me thing's been trickier than I anticipated. Also want to do something above crass commercial uh, garbage, but turns out there isn't much in the civilian world that is. My first instructor was Japanese American raised in internment camps, Ben Sakaguchi. He said, all art is political, all right, next. Then he retired, his best friend was Phil Cornelius. He was prior army. And so he gave me, you know, Big Sergeant Tool. Look at Big Sergeant Tool getting his ass kicked by five pounds of clay. So there was a little uh, service rivalry there. He said I couldn't decorate my cups. So I went home and started making sprig molds and decorating cups 100% out of spite. And he said anybody can take a good idea and work with it for years, but it takes a special kind of person to take a bad idea and work with it for years. He made real thin teapots and I give stuff away, <laughs> right? Next, this is undergrad stuff, Trans, uh, transferred from slides, if anybody knows what, remembers what those are. This is a popcorn bowl and salt and pepper shaker for the next war on TV, next. And then transferred to USC and Ken Price was the instructor there. He was also army between Korea and Vietnam, I think. 
and uh, he was very proud. He went into private and he got out of private. He kept getting busted for going AWOL, going down to uh, Mexico surfing. All right, next. Self-portrait, lots of beer involved. All right, next. Lawn ornaments made in America for export only. All right, next. So those are the size and shape of a chemical or an anti-tank landmine, next. Yeah, so I threw those and made a mold and lawn ornaments. All right, next. And then uh, after undergrad, I got a show in exchange for uh, building some walls. And this is the work I was doing at the time. This is a letter to the, um, the Bush administration congratulating them on their position and uh, wishing them luck in, in accomplishing some good things. All right, next. And the gallery gave me a show and he said, I'm gonna give you the show even though your work isn't relevant to anything that's going on in Los Angeles. <laughs> so I had a thousand cups like this and letters that I'd sent to the Pentagon and White House, next. And the show opened the month after 9-11 and people were like, oh my gosh, your work is so timely. But I was like, actually, I was talking about the Gulf War 10 years ago, but it'll be about the next war too. And unfortunately that's come to pass in my entire career or whatever you wanna call it, we've been at war, all right, next. Uh, this is a letter to the United Nations Security Council asking them to please do what they can to avoid another, avoid another war. All right, next. Um, then I left my full-time job at USC. I, after I graduated, they gave me a job as the lab tech there. My wife was teaching elementary school. She wanted to move back up to Berkeley. So we both quit our full-time jobs, got married. These are the wedding invitations my wife made. All right, next. And then uh, I blew off my first week of grad school to go to Burning Man, <laughs> do this art installation. That's an A-10 Warthog in the back and a CBU-87 cluster bomb in the front, next. Uh, an A-10 or an F-16 carry four of those bombs. Each bomb has 202 bomblets, next. Uh, each bomblet has, a, it's about the size of a 24 ounce beer can, has a zirconium ring to start fire as a shape charge to go through metal and perforated steel casing for shrapnel. Each one of those has like a 70 meter casualty radius, 202 in each one of those bombs, all right? Next. That's what the bomblets look like. Isn't that a cute name, bomblets? So we dropped 10,035 of those CBU-87 cluster bombs. So 10,035 times 202 are the number of these little bomblets we sprinkled around uh, Saudi Arabia, or, uh, Iraq and Kuwait, all right, next. So I did this installation, <laughs> it was cool on paper. This is 808 cups in a grid, 200 meters by 1600 meters, but you know, can't really see it, <laughs> All right, next. So if that had been, you know, if those bombs had actually been dropped on that, in that space, it would have been really bad. All right, next. And I hadn't been in the desert since the Gulf War and I had a little panic attack when the dust storm kicked up because during the Gulf War, we, they had blown these, um, breaches through the minefields and, and MP company headquarters at the time, First Marine Division, we were responsible for keeping the breaches open or at least radioing back <laughs> that they were open. And there'd be a sandstorm and the mines would disappear and then there'd be another one and they'd reappear. And so it made you real paranoid about where you walked. All right, next. Then I uh, went to grad school at UC Berkeley. Richard Shaw was the instructor there. All right, next. I can't say I look good in that, but it looks right. In grad school, they were giving me a hard time about cups, why cups, just, yeah, right? It looks looks right, it doesn't look good, but it looks right. All right, so I think that peace is the only adequate war memorial. I think that everything else at best is, is usually a failure, is at best a failure and usually a lie that promotes war as a good and noble thing. All right, next. Like this is the World War II memorial built way after so many of the World War II vets are gone and America is much more like 30s Germany than it was 30s America. All right, next. So this is my first year of grad school. This is my <laughs> first introduction to Berkeley, but my first year of grad school was the end of Gulf War II, air quotes, right? Because we never stopped bombing them. There were 393 US combat casualties. So I made glazed, decorated and shot 393 cups. All right, next. So each one of the next. So each one of these cups could go unchipped for 500,000 to a million years or a little piece of lead hits them and that's that, all right, next. And it was funny in grad school, like, like functional pottery, 
crickets. Nobody had anything to say about functional pottery. As soon as I shot them, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they just talk and talk. All right, next. So in grad school, under pressure, trying to do something else. That's the, the eagles and the trophy on top are ceramic and the tile there. That's a, uh, a metal, or a, sorry, a trophy for getting your leg blown off and your eyes burned out with gas. All right, next. And then they gave me a hard time uh, about the cups being kind of wonky and bottom heavy, but you know, so am I. So I didn't think it was a big deal, but, but so this cup was made in China, shipped to Florida. In Florida, they made a decal of an image of one of my cups, fired that image onto the cup in Florida and then shipped it to me in California. That whole process cost less than for me to buy the porcelain to make the same number of cups. All right, next. In grad school, Abu Gray happened and this is a uh, luster trying to figure out ways to decorate cups next. And this is a uh, letters I sent to the no bid contract winners, winners to rebuild Iraq. All right, next. And while in grad school, I, I had a kid. I don't anticipate, you know, don't suggest that for grad students, but my wife said she wanted to try to have a baby. I was like, yeah, let's try. But, uh, you know, it happened like the first or second time. So, all right, next. These are the cups I passed out at the hospital. I probably should have made his penis bigger, but the doc at first, he's like, what's up with these cups? They're kind of dark. And I was like, well, that's an aspect of the world the boy's being born into, right? And, you know, a little shocking for the pastel world of the maternity ward. But then the doc said, yeah, you know, the Air Force paid for my education. <laughs> All right, next. This is my first thesis proposal. I didn't weld that open. So if the cup was too heavy, it just exploded. And eventually on a pedestal or something, you know, vibrations, it would just snap. I thought we could put a vitrine over or something, but the, the uh, curator said, absolutely not. So next. So this is my thesis exhibition. I made a thousand cups and this is letters and, and uh, cups I sent to the Pentagon and White House and the cabinet uh, the, for the second term, the second Bush administration, asking them to please do what they can to keep the outcome as close as possible to the stated goal, right? The stated goal is always beautiful. Iraqi freedom, no child left behind, but the outcome, not so much. All right, next. And this is when vets from Gulf War II start showing up at, on campus and things, and that starts getting really weird for me. All right, next. Yeah, next. Yeah, it was weird, like, and, and somehow Google Images had, like, or AP images, you know, Aaron Tool veteran, AP did a story on me. And then you could click on the link for related images and like stuff on Iraq started showing up, Marines in Iraq and dogs eating corpses and stuff. All right, next, cups, all right. <laughs> so now this is, now I'm out, I'm a real artist. <laughs> so this is my uh, 1.5 second war memorial. So I made glazed, uh, this is, there's a video loop. It's still online, I think. It's 99 cups, so there's an image and then it gets shot. It's an image and then it gets shot. So if you want to watch it to honor all the folks that died in my war, you watch it for a few, or the Americans that died in my war, you watch it for a few minutes. If you want to watch it for everybody killed in World War II, all theaters, all sides, you have to watch it for almost three years. All right, next. At 1.5 seconds of life, 1.5 second more and more. All right, next. Cups. Somebody gave me some money, so I made a bunch of cups. <laughs> it's fancy porcelain. All right, next. And we gave them away. I couldn't reach the ones on top. All right, next. Cups, next. And then uh, under pressure, I went and approached the commercial gallery about having a show. And the woman was like, oh, the work is strong, but what's for sale? And I said, well, there's more to art than money, right? And she said, not much. <laughs> and then she said, why don't you make something bigger? I was like, why bigger? So we can sell it for more money. I didn't want to do that. So instead, I made a rifle company, Marine Corps Rifle Company. Next. So you could buy the whole company for one price. Next. You could buy a platoon for another price. Next. Or you could buy a, a squad, which is 13, or a fire team, which is four. The idea was if, the, if they sell, then they live forever in the one true art world as big A art. If they don't, then they die alone. Next. Full of booze is fun time hobby craft. So out of those, I, I sold 13. <laughs> All right, next. Porcelain, ooh, translucent, next. Yeah, next. Next. Uh, Otto Dix is a 
artist from, he was a World War I vet, did four years at the front as a machine gunner. This is his print, uh, Victims of Capitalism, all right, next. So yeah, it's hard to see on the bowl there, but there's that woman holding those things where her breast used to be. And underneath there is a diagram of, it's like World War I and the American Civil War is the birth of plastic surgery. So one begot the other, but it's kind of like the hyper, you know, the victims of capitalism, the hyper feminine kind of sex toy, and then the hyper masculine Robocop part machine. All right, next. I was one of Allison Smith's uh, crafty kids for her notion any project next this is my modeling debut michael swain he said he through a friend i met him he wanted me to he wanted a veteran to model one of his shirts in uh in braille the bullet holes say a plea for tenderness and i thought i was showing up at a at an art show right like but it was a straight up fashion show and so there was me and these beautiful underfed boys and girls standing on pedestals. <laughs> and so it was, it was super awkward. Yeah, next. So this is my version of that. So the two squads in the center, I shot those and then patched the holes and in Braille, it says a plea for tenderness. All right, next. This is my digital debut. Yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but that's uh, MCRD Marine Recruit Depot, San Diego. And in the in Photoshop, I closed the eyes of all the guys that died. This was for the son of one of the Marines that survived, or one of the Marines, the Marine who survived. This is 1943, and all of the Marines but one didn't, didn't make it through the war. All right, next. Cops, next. Next. Porcelain cups, so laser engraved into a block of wood and then shoved it into the porcelain, and so the thicker parts are darker and the thinner parts are lighter next then i uh, i was all proud i took a tile and I, I taped the back of it and i shot it and then i made a mold of the bullet hole through the tile and pressed it into the clay i was all proud of it i brought it home showed it to my mother-in-law and she laughed and said looks like a butthole <laughs> so way to keep it uh real there marcia she's in the next room listening <laughs> Yeah, so that that that's not a hole. It's just it's real thin, translucent. Or that. All right, next. And then uh, Ian Martin, a friend, we went out to the woods and shot a bunch of cups. So another friend had a seven point six two rifle, and Ian Martin had a high uh, high speed flash, rented a high speed flash and a, a big large format camera, and we shot a bunch of cups. And so that's just that moment, right, where your child or that kid has that you know, the potential, and then a little piece of lead hits it, and it's gone forever. All right, next. That's pretty cool. I want to do it in color, but the photographer insisted they be black and white. All right, next. And then we got a grant to make, a, make cups in China. To make China in China, uh, heads up. The Chinese are not impressed. They've 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 done it. <laughs> and I was, I was complaining to my father, like, Dad, nobody in China likes my work. My dad said, son, China is a quarter of the world's population. Somebody has to like your work. All right, next. And this is the guy, Shui Bo Wang, the one guy who likes my work in China. He, was, he joined the Red Army when he was 16 to fight capitalism, to protect the world against capitalism, was uh, one of Chairman Mao's sunflowers and was in Tiananmen with his students when the, the, uh, the government cracked down on it. I guess the Beijing army units wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, crush the protest in Beijing and so they trained another unit from outside of Beijing and they told them that they were all foreign agitators and so then the Beijing army unit uh, left and this other unit came in and just crushed it and so when I met Shui Boang he was coming back to China for the first time in 20 years he had he left and moved to Canada just super disappointed in you know how, how things had turned out and there's some overlap, you know, my father joined to, to fight the world against communism, <laughs> to protect the world against communism, but the ideals were the same. Both people were trying to do the right thing. All right, next. Oh, sorry, it's broken because a student broke it and then she glued it back together. I mailed it to him anyway. And he said it was one of the greatest gifts he received. All right, and then uh, that thing hanging from the ceiling is the size and shape of a CBU-87 cluster bomb. If it's a shelf that holds 202 cups. It's suspended from the ceiling by a chain. All right, next. And it's, oh yeah, 202 cups, all right, next. 
and then the image on the floor there is an aerial photograph centered on the gallery, and that's the footprint, 200 meters by 400 meters. That's the footprint for one CBU-87 cluster bomb. All right, next. So this is my fantasy. I still, I still have this fantasy that we're going to do something like this one day. I'm making a proposal for Ansika in Sacramento. But right, like you want to protect yourself, protect your community. And so the temptation is to build walls and build fences. But another way to protect yourself, protect your community might be to expand your community, right? Destroy your enemy by making me your friend. So the idea is to, to build like a bunker or a wall out of clay and then come together and, and take, the, take the bunker apart, make cups and expand the community. All right, next. So this is how, this is, this is the previous picture was the, the thought and this is the actual thing. <laughs> this was at gestures of resistance at the Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland, which doesn't exist anymore. Namita Wiggers, I really got a shout out to her, like how brave she was to put me in there. I heard she got grief for the way she was displaying teapots. And then she let me come in there with images of gay porn and dead babies and things, you know, like people are coming to look at teapots and craft and then <laughs> a little jarring. All right, next. So yeah, the curators, just as a resistance to uh, Judith Lehman and Shannon Stratton. All right, next. So I just like these pictures, right? From my hand to your hand to some point, 500,000 to a million years in the future. It's kind of cool, right? Next. Yeah, next. So then we got a grant to go to Vietnam to make cups. I, my father was a army officer, infantry officer, and he all his maps and patrol books and stuff were all stained with red clay. So I wanted to go to Vietnam and make cups there. So at the bottom there is Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon, and at the top is uh, Bien Hoa, American Air Base. All right, next. So that brown spot is the American Air Base. That's one of the, one of the big uh, Agent Orange hotspots. When we left, the Vietnamese dumped the Agent Orange to recycle the metal, not knowing what it was. And it's still an Agent Orange hotspot to this day. All right, next. So that, that water tower, that little, it's gonna, sh oh, it's gonna be in another picture. So um, the top of the, oops, sorry, yeah. The top is the air base, that brown spot. And then at the bottom of the triangle a little bit is where the school, the school that I got to work. I had a student in Berkeley who had family in Vietnam and she hooked, me, hooked us up with a studio there. So I got to make cups there, All right, next. And in the back there, you can see that water tower. When I came back from my art thing <laughs> in Vietnam, my father got his slides digitized that he took while he was in Vietnam. And I saw this in his, in my father's slides and that's that water tower being built when my father was there as a soldier. All right, next. And I had taken this picture of walking on the sidewalk as an artist, all right, next. So that's my father in, in Vietnam at the time. And I want you to remember this picture because it's gonna come up a couple more times in the thing. All right, next. And that's me in Vietnam. And it turned out we were about 45 minutes away. He was 45 minutes north from Bien Hoa. All right, next. Oh, sorry, can you go back? That's a joke too, right? Like I forgot my apron. So see, I bought one there. In the end, I ended up buying four aprons. So I tied one around my neck and one on each leg and one in the middle. <laughs> and I wanted, okay, yeah, next. They were really proud of those porcelain that they had. And, you know, they were really talented and uh, competent artists, but I insisted on using clay from Vietnam. So this is, this is the clay, all right, next being delivered. And this is us firing the kiln. Um, they were very diligent. Mr. Coy there on the right, the yellow shirt, he was, he was very diligent. He'd get up and record the time and temperature each half hour or 15 minutes. But as the night went on, it got a little bigger and a little looser. And Mr. Golden Hand sitting next to my wife, Sarah there, he was, he was the top guy. They were, they were great. We ran out of beer and they brought out this like gallon jar. We never did figure out what the creature was, but there was some kind of sea creature inside that like hard alcohol, like uh, Everclear or something. But yeah, that was, that was good. And these are the cups. I didn't glaze them because I wanted to be about the, the clay. So I left half there and brought half back to the States. And the idea was to sell the cups to raise money to do um, Agent Orange remediation and unexploded ordnance. We dropped more bombs in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos than all sides in all theaters in World War II. All right, next. 
the guy that took the picture, I think, had a crush on one of these girls, but these were the students at the university. My wife's 5'10", you know, redhead, like at the time, <laughs> and my son, little blonde haired, blue eyed kid, we were like, really, we really stuck out in BNY. And I was expecting some kind of grief, especially as an Agent Orange hotspot, but not one person said anything negative to us at all. It was really, it was really kind of moving. All right, next. Um, these are cups in Berlin. Next. Um, this gallery stopped. Short. Now they only do prints, Bangu, or yeah, in uh, Berlin. But they gave me their FedEx number and asked me to ship the stuff. And then they were just super bummed at how much it cost. <laughs> but, but they sold these cups for 100 bucks a piece there. Yeah, next. And these are cups in Kansas City that did not sell for $35 a piece. And these are the cups from Vietnam. All right, next. Uh, I got this invitation to show in Scotland just through email. I, you know, it could have been somebody's living room as far as I know, but they seemed like cool guys. All right, next. And the show happened to be on President's Day. So I was at home thrown in the basement, drinking famous grouse scotch whiskey, thinking I was doing something cool. It turns out that's cooking whiskey and should never be drank straight. But I got to Skype at the opening, which is a lot of fun. All right, next. And this is when I realized I had crossed that line between productive and obsessive. Uh, Suzanne Erskine at the Contemporary Craft asked me if I wanted a solo show or a group show. And I was like, well, shoot, I guess if you're asking, I want a solo show. But then I you know, got super nervous that I'd have enough work to fill. So for this show, I made 1,300 cups. All right, next. I was kind of intense because we were, uh, you know, I was sitting, this is, uh, Contemporary Craft is right across the street from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Labrea, well, directly across from La Brea Tar Pits and close to the museum, uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art. So we'd be sitting there and these like student groups would come by like, oh, cool, guns, make me a cup. And then, you know, vets would come by. And I, I'll say uh, there was a, a guy came in and he was really, he went and looked at the show and came back and was really kind of quiet. And we talked for a little bit and he said that he was a hospital corpsman during the Korean War. He's Japanese American hospital corpsman uh, during the Korean War. And they didn't, First Marine Division didn't have enough field corpsmen. So they trained him up because of the losses, because of the casualties they'd had. So they sent him to, to, to Korea to support First Marine Division as a, as a Navy corpsman. And I said, uh, and he said, I think that's probably the most complete conversation. Like we didn't need to say anything else. That was, that was it. Like uh, that was a bad scene. Also these like stereotypical, like Australian tourists, the Hawaiian shirt and talking real loud came by and, you know, they went up, Hey mate, what's going on here? Ah. They went up and checked the shot. And the guy came back, like somebody had died and was just like totally silent. And he kind of got up close and said that he was a Vietnam vet. And I told him, I was like, oh, my dad's here with me. He's a Vietnam vet too. And he dropped me and went talk to my dad. And I kept throwing and I turned around and these like guys in their 60s or 70s, they're just sobbing, you know. And I guess in Australia, it was a real, it was an unpopular war. And so a lot of people didn't talk about it. So anyway, next. Yeah, so um, my dad came, Drew Cameron, the combat paper came. So we made paper. So. All right, next. So that's us shredding our uniforms there. And then that, that same photograph there, there's a one in four chance, right? That we, my father and I each had four uniforms that we wore in combat. And so there's a one in four chance that the uniform we wore in combat is the uniform that we shredded. So we shredded this paper, put it in a hammer mill and made paper, pulled paper out of it. All right, next. Uh, throwing at the uh, Indianapolis war memorial. Indianapolis War Memorial Building built in the 30s between World War One and World War Two. It's a creepy, weird old building. Like there's some Illuminati madness going on there. All right, next. Yeah, it was Kurt Vonnegut's birthday. So that's how I got invited out. All right, next. Uh, I threw a bunch of cups at the Berkeley Art Museum and then they disc fired them and <laughs> kids decorated them. I'm not sure they knew what the images were next but they're cooler than they would have been if I had decorated them. All right, next. Uh, Drew Cameron got a grant, so he and I 
did these uh, paper cups. So I'd throw cups and he'd, he'd make paper, All right? Next. Cups, next. The Palo Alto Art Museum had me out for a month to make cups. That was super sweet. They like, they built these shelves for me and gave me a place to stay, paid for the clay, paid, paid what I make at my day job, All right? Next. And then we gave the cups away. I love that the sign, please don't touch. I'm like, I'm giving them all away. Of course they can touch them. The idea was to make, you know, to give the cups to other veterans and stuff. Turns out there aren't a lot of vets in Palo Alto. I did meet some people, children of defense contractors, guys that made the weapons that we used. All right, next. Are we like two hours in? Yeah, all right. So uh, I got asked to be in a show and when asked if I could make something that's not so political, I was like, sure. All right, next. So she passed. I, I didn't get in the show. I, I love it when people are like, I love your work, but can you make a video? Like, what? I don't make video. Anyway, yeah, next. So then at Pro Arts in Oakland, I got invited to work there and do the same thing. So for a month, I had a show. All right, next. And I was a little nervous. This is Oscar Grant or Frank, Frank Ogawa Plaza. And you know, a little nervous about a big white boy dropping into downtown Oakland, throwing cups, you know, felt like an invader or something. But actually, that was kind of much cooler. And I met a lot more vets down there in Oakland. Some of them had drug and alcohol problems. But uh, guess what, guys? So do I. So <laughs> next. So that was actually a lot of fun. All right, next. And this is giving away this had a little heartbreaking moment there. The black kid grabbed the cup and I was like, hey, why'd you pick that cup? Like, can you tell me about the cup? And and he looked, you know, I looked at it and it had the gas mask that I wanted to go for, but he thought that they were cops because of the militarization of the police department since the Gulf War, which kind of broke my heart. All right, next, uh, National Veterans Art Museum in Chicago. My son took that pick, yeah, next. All right, and as I was throwing there, I had the cups against the wall. This, this couple came in, you know, guy had the Vietnam vet hat on, wife had the wife of a Vietnam vet hat on, their son, and they were, the father and son were kind of looking at this display in one corner that had the things they carried, you know, had like a, an actual pack and helmet and stuff. So you could see what the guys were humping through the jungle with. The woman kind of made a quick beeline. This is the National Veterans Art Museum. The show was all combat vets from Korea, I think was the oldest guy, and then Iraq and Afghanistan. The woman kind of made a, a beeline through it. And then real loud, she said, I'm leaving. This is rude. This is offensive. And I'm like, you know, she didn't even look at my work or she stormed out. And I was like, at the time I was kind of shocked, but later I got really mad. I'm like, wait, you wanted to, you came to this veterans war memorial or veterans art thing. And you want to have a conversation about war, but you want it to be polite and inoffensive. <laughs> like." you better scrape that yellow ribbon off your truck and take that hat off because it's, you don't really mean what you're saying. All right, next. Isn't he cute? All right, next. And then we got an invitation, like just cold out of the, it actually turned out that the cups that I had shown in Berlin 10 years before, a curator, or he, a French guy was doing his military service in Berlin and then was a curator at this residency in France called the uh, Ven de Forêt, Winds of the Forest near Verdun, all right, next. And he asked me if I wanted to come out to France to make cups for a month and a half. I was like, uh, yeah, but I can't be left alone that long. Like you gotta bring my wife and kid too. And they paid for my wife and kid and I to all come to France and make cups. So Pierre Feet is, is where we were making the cups. And then that red zone, that's that was the front there, that whole area. And the red zone is, the director said, there are parts of the forest she is forbidden. And still a hundred years after the war in this region of France, there's still unexploded ordnance mines, uh, mustard gas, phosgene, chlorine, um, canisters buried there. All right, next. But it was beautiful, right? So this is, this is actual the battlefield from a hundred years before. So none of those trees, there's nothing <laughs> that was a hundred years old. All this is since the war. At the time, this was all just a, a blown up moonscape. But you know, you'd be walking around and there'd be these little weird looking vines and hey, that's not a vine, that's, that's German barbed wire. You can tell because the barbs are closer together. But I was like, <laughs> I was very, you know, 
the other people were just kind of stomping through the forest, but I was following the deer trails because I was like, I am not going to die of, you know, be the last combat casualty of World War One, but, or not combat, but, and I guess the farmers in that area too, right? So it was German farmers fighting French farmers on, on, on farmland, um, but they still, they still dig up mines and, and things and get killed today. All right, next. This was the commute. So like, it's, it's this little, a bunch of little villages so we were staying at one place and then we'd walk to the studio all right next and so yeah so see that like red post there in the front they had just replaced that so as they were digging up in the foundation this is where during world war one the women would do the laundry all right next so this is an image from 100 years ago so on the right there is is the studio i was working on the left is that same set up and there's a, a mill further down so they would dam dam it up to run the mill and raise the water level and then the folks would do the laundry you can kind of see some people there but i was all right next i think or anyway i was sitting there at the on the creek there eating my baguette and drinking my beer and just in the dirt not digging around or anything you could see buttons from world war one and coins and things so i was there for a couple of weeks by myself and then my wife and son came is pretty cool all right next and they kind of liked my work right the locals because the farmers i guess the the federal government paid the local government to do this thing and then the farmers bought in and this art residency bought in so it was a real community thing so you know guys would come by with tractors they'd leave them idling out there and walk into my studio where i was working like they owned the place and you know pick up cups and look at stuff and it was cool and you know and it was folks would come and give images of their family that were veterans right because we're like like literally one of the places we stayed in like the, the world war one vet had walked from there to the front line and fought for four years and then his brother was a pow across the valley and it was the granddaughter that we were staying with anyway they liked my cups kind of but man they loved my wife's work and there was a, a family that had just had a baby and so she made this that was funny too. One of the, <laughs> they were talking and this French kid said something about me and, and everybody laughed. And I was like, what do you say? And the little kid said, is he pregnant? <laughs> I said, yeah, I am. And I grabbed his hand and put it on my belly and kind of kicked. Him. <laughs> so there's some poor kid in France that thinks American men can get pregnant. All right, next. And this, I, I didn't, I was totally unaware of the stress, but, um, this is the potter that fired all the stuff. We made the stuff and then had to drive it to this pottery. We bisque fired it at the studio and then glazed fired it here. And the director was really, I could tell he was uncomfortable about something, but the deal was, I guess, that the director had hooked or asked another artist, ceramic artist, to come and work with this potter. And she had told this, the host potter that she was a better artist than he was. And so he fired her work and then unloaded it and threw it all on the floor <laughs> so but luckily we got along so it was it was awesome i told him like in a month and a half i will definitely be able to make a thousand cups no problem but then uh, lunch was two hours every day with hard alcohol so you know halfway through or a couple weeks in i told the director i was like man it's not going to happen i can't do it with these big lunches oh but you must it's political you must so i only made 800 cups all right next and then I thought we were just gonna give them all away at this event they have every summer. But instead, this, uh, this is the pump house for this little town nearby. It was built in like 1830 or, or something. And all right, next, and it was, had these huge stone walls. And so the farmers, they came and filled this, at the bottom there, there's water that just kind of trickles in like from the spring. And then they filled it with gravel so kids wouldn't drown in there. All the, all the mechanics, the pump stuff had been taken out years before. They filled it with gravel so it was only about six inches deep and then put this huge stone in there. And something about the thickness of the walls and the, and the water made it like degrees cooler inside there. And then they, the wood from the forest, they made the shelves. And so I made 800 cups, but you could only display about 40 at the time. So I think to this day, if you go to this resident, if you go to this this place in France, this working forest, working they like they hunt and they they harvest wood, and then the work of the art is displayed there. So there's another level of curation. If the locals don't like your stuff, things burn or disappear. <laughs> but I think my cups are still there. But it was so much cooler in there, and it was really weird going from the forest, this beautiful like 
dreamy forest into this thing and then seeing these cups that like you know in a city maybe they're not as jarring images of war and violence and stuff but in the in this you know it was really kind of upsetting all right next yeah so there was some really bad whiskey they had so you could have a shot there this is this is the beginning of the beard here my son he somehow heard i said i wouldn't grow a beard as long as my grandmother was alive and he heard, I will grow a beard when my grandmother dies. So I was like, we're in France, who cares? I'll grow a beard. And then my son said, I like your, your beard better than your face. <laughs> so I kept the beard. I didn't make my wife answer that question, but all right, next. And then a friend of a friend like invited me to this other guy's studio, which I didn't realize until like we got back home, but it's usually a thing you pay for in Berlin. Man, the difference between France and Berlin was comical. Like a month and a half in France, in Berlin, we went one day and made cups. We went one day in glazed cups. We went one day, unloaded the kiln and had a little party. And lunch was 30 minutes each time. And then Berlin, it was, it was kind of intense because they're like, in Germany, we don't talk about the war. Can I talk to you? And then like, they'd pull me aside and tell me these just insane stories, you know, of people who had no involvement in, in the war but, but their, their parents or their grandparents had and, and just the, the guilt and the, the you know, stuff they carried was really intense because they talk a lot about veterans but not so much about their families and how things get passed on. All right, next. Uh, but this is for the Nsika there and the Nelson Atkins Museum. This was super cool. I, I mean, I'm not showing with Gerhard Richter but I'm showing with Gerhard Richter. All right, next. And then I talked to the curator, I was like, hey, it'd be cool to have like, you know, vets come out and we'll make cups for them. But I was like, you know, it's kind of hard to get vets out. So maybe we can open it up to other folks who've lost family to violence. And that was rough. So <laughs> they had a group of like parents whose children had committed suicide and um, whatever. So like, it was like some alternate reality Santa thing. Like my two little minions there were great. Jazz and Andrew, and they would take the images and scan the images so that they could later put decals on the cups I was making. But then the people would come and sit next to me and tell me like how their kid had committed suicide or died in a war. So we're sitting in the lobby of this museum and just sobbing <laughs> and student groups are coming through like, what's happening? Anyway, the curator was great, right? At five o'clock, the doors shut and she brought out a 12 pack and we just sat and drank. And we're just like, man, what was that? <laughs> All right, next, and Garth there. After that that thing at the clay studio, man. Yeah, but I gotta say love to him that like, he called me and wanted me to throw for hours. I was like, dude, what, can I get some backup? I know another vet Potter and he's like, who, Jesse Albrecht? I was like, yeah. And so we got to hang out together. So that made it totally worth it, but whatever. So this is in Arizona. Um, at his previous gig and hooked me up with Eric Gromberg, which I, I was unaware of, but it uh, turns out I've been ripping him off for years. All right, next. And then uh, my dad's for his, his birthday, we, we took a train from Sacramento to Charleston, South Carolina, where he and I were born. And um, I had some cups in the Smithsonian and the permanent collection there. And I told them like, hey, you can give some cups to the staff and the cure is like, absolutely not. Once they're in the collection, it's like an act of Congress to deacquisition them. So I mailed some cups to a friend and then, and like, I didn't realize how close the Renwick Museum is to the White House, but it's like, it's like, whatever, it's right there. So we brought these boxes and it happened to be like an Arab Uber driver or Lyft driver that brought us there. And we're like getting out of the car with these boxes walking into this thing. And the security guys were flipping out. I don't know, they didn't know we were coming. All right, next. Um, but this is in the Renwick. And so there's my cups on the wall and Peter Volkus who taught at UC Berkeley that just happened to be a show. Well, this is the permanent collection stuff, but Volkus was actually also having a show at the time. All right, next. One of the guards, Mr. White, he was very intense and asking me about all the cups. All right, next. And Nora Atkinson. Boy, she looks bigger on TV, I tell you. But um, she was super sweet, and and I brought all the cups. We put them out, and I asked if she could, you know, give or let the staff come through and pick them. But she refused to take one for herself until everybody else had picked one. All right, next. So yeah, next. 
and it was fun because a few of the the guards and staff there were also vets all right next and she was the boss lady she and and she had a pistol on the side that was almost as big as her leg <laughs> kind of intimidating all right next uh at the script show there lots of cups next yeah, cups. I think that's the underlying for everything. This necro capitalism, right? It's not just making money. It's it's something darker. Like we're making money until we die. All right. Next. This is cool. Mr. Fish. He's a cartoonist, political cartoonist. He does these things, and I I really liked his work. I stole some Dwayne Booth. I had taken some and altered them a little bit so they worked on the cups, and and then I was like, ah. So I mailed them some cups and said hey man i've only made a few of these with your images on it if it's not cool i'll smash them but he's like no man fight the power the man <laughs> they're all yours <laughs> like do what you want so as i as i borrow his images tactically acquire his images i, I send him cups all right next yeah i don't know if that's gonna work but you know uh every target is somebody's kid it's a little video it spins around but oh there you go <laughs> right so even a totally justified target is still somebody's kid and when i was in the marines i was like i'm i'm in the marine corps i made it others didn't so be it but now after having a kid everybody is somebody's kid and it just all seems super wrong all right next yeah so then I got to go to haystack it was awesome right but it was all vets and um but like what on a Wednesday, on my birthday, May 16th, I, I was riding my bike and my crank snapped and I fell and broke four ribs and punctured a lung. And I was laying on the asphalt and I was like, I'm still going to Haystack. So I spent the night in the hospital on Wednesday and then got on a plane on Saturday, <laughs> made cups. And then uh, Jessica Putnam Phillips here, she's like, let's collaborate. I'm sorry, I can't do her voice. She's got a super high voice. Let's collaborate on a piece. And I was like, really? Like. Her stuff is pretty, you know, she's an Air Force vet, but her stuff is still pretty flowery. All right, next. So I made this, I was like, yeah, right. So I put all these skulls and things on it and she pulled a handle and decorated it. And, and then she insisted on, after they were bisque fired, taking, taking them home so she could luster fire them and put this pearlescent glaze on it. It was hilarious, but I love them and her. All right, next. Uh, Diablo Valley College got to, we set up it, uh, we set up in the studio there and made a bunch of work and the the veterans community there came out and made cups with us all right next that's the stuff the vets made but it was cool because they could pick their own stamps and either i'd make a cup for them or they can make their own all right and yeah there's i don't know what i'm doing all right next and working with the vets has really been a great thing this is at berkeley and it's been a great let's say the community and working as artists, like traveling the world as a as a Marine or a soldier is, you know, it's life changing, but it's not nearly as fun as going as an artist. All right, next. So um, I had written all these letters to since Clinton was in office, you know, each each new group. But when Trump came to office, right to Bush, I could say, please keep the outcome as close as possible to the stated goal. But to Trump, I really had a hard time thinking of what what to say to him. So uh, I just sent him a cup here, next. So that's a Prothagorean cup, or in China they're called Greedy Man's Cup. So if you fill it up below the hand, it's fine, it works like a regular cup. If you fill it up above the hand, it becomes a, a siphon and it drains, not to the hand, it drains all the way to the like bottom of the cup. So I sent him that cup, next. And that's a humanitarian ward on the inside. And this letter, this is a Langston Hughes poem, which I can't. I always thought I should memorize this cup, but I can't get <laughs> through the first line without crying. So Langston Hughes, uh, let America be America again, I thought was really beautiful. And then Matt Kenyon Ken Ken made that paper. So it's a blue line, yellow paper. And if you look at the blue lines with a, a microscope, it has the names, dates, and locations of Iraqi civilians that have been killed. And he's been making this paper. He has like pads of this yellow paper and he's, he somehow is sneaking it back into the State Department and Department of State, State Department and Department of Defense. And so then as people are writing notes and they get archived, there's like this other secret archive in there. All right, next. Trump's response, yeah, next. 
Yeah, I just make up. Next, and you know, I think some of that, like I'm realizing the saying I just make cups or like even the way I talk about them, like I was really broken with the gap between what I thought I was gonna do in the Marine Corps and what I did. And I can't really invest too much in the fantasy about the cups being more than just cups because if it turns out they're just cups, it'll be super sad. So I don't, yeah, they're just cups. Um, this is the National Veterans Art Museum Triennial in Chicago. And again, hanging out with vets is really cool. All right, next. And as part of their thing, after we left, they had these guys, and this is a group of, of guys in Chicago, and they've either been shot themselves or have had friends that have been killed. And, you know, like we go around the world dropping bombs on people and saying all this stuff, but like a black man, 18 to 30, is statistically safer in the Marine Corps in Afghanistan at the height of the war, at the worst part of the war, than in any large city in the United States. And that's just madness to me. And going forward, I'd like to, you know, I think a lot of vets, part of the thing that's hard coming back is, you you know, you joined to serve and you want to do these good and noble things, but there's a, you know, what you actually end up doing, maybe not so much. And, but I think that a lot of vets really do have a desire to serve. And I think a good thing, you know, like if you say, like, I, I never thought I needed help. I didn't think I had problems, <laughs> you know, until I saw the younger guys like, wow, he's really drinking a lot. And then like, oh shoot, so did I, didn't I, or don't I like, so it, it really helps. So I think it could help vets and there's other, pro like the mission continues, but connecting kids in the States. And that's a joke too, right? A lot of the guys in the Marine Corps come from these like in crisis communities, you know, we had black and Hispanic gangbangers from New York, shave their head, put them in a uniform and then they serve together fighting the Iraqis and no problem, you know, but then you, then they get out and they go back home and, you know, the cops don't treat them any better because they were in the Marine Corps. There's no, there's no understanding in the community, you know, their service. So that's a frustration. I hope going forward, we can do more stuff together with, or that, like I, like, like a lot of folks have kind of dropped into the veteran community, especially with the suicide rate being so high and they're not veterans, you know, maybe the good intentions, but there's also a paycheck in there sometimes. And they drop in and they do their little program, they get their check and they bug out. And, you know, the vets are kind of left. And so I'm, I'm curious, I'm conscious and, and cautious about jumping into other communities, you know, with the intention to help. But so I, I kind of do it through the military or through the cups, through that connection. I serve with black guys and, you know, but like trying to make sincere connections and not just like, you know, cool images or whatever. I don't know. But that's kind of why I stick with the cups and the military background. All right, next. Right? Yeah, next. So, I mean, that's kind of subtle, but like black and white guys die side by side and are buried side by side. And, you know, why can't they live side by side? All right, next. And then like, I gotta say this whole response to the COVID thing and to wear or not to wear a mask and how politicized that has been has really bummed me out. You know, this is like a hundred year old issue. If we can't figure that out and, you know, it's pretty basic stuff, like basic science. How are we going to deal with climate change and the other things facing us? All right. Oh, we're almost done, folks. Yeah. So I know like this is not the appropriate way to document a cup, but it always bugs me, right? You take a cup and there's like, you take the, a two dimensional picture of a three dimensional object, you're going to miss something. So next. So I like these, but talking about COVID, talking about the dodo, talking about climate change, right? The US military is the largest source of pollution or defense, you know, and then obviously we don't do like a climate impact when we invade a country, all right, next. Take care of the postal service. I love those guys, all right, next. Oh yeah, all right, so this is a bummer. So Garth just sent this thing with uh, eBay. I'm on eBay, they're for sale. And, you know, I think I realize it's capitalism, right? So the two options are either be forgotten completely or sold, right, next. But there was this one cup, right? <laughs> Good luck, buddy. <laughs> All right, next. Yeah, so this is a cup and it's 2005. So I think it was one I gave away at my thesis show. All right, next. But that's a picture of my dad, right? That's that same picture from Vietnam. And so that's been a little weird, like, you know, and I guess eventually that's inevitable, right? Like, uh, it's going to happen, but it's weird, like, because these cups are going to last 500,000 to a million years. So, 
eventually the cups will be disconnected from their history, right? But it's a little weird to see it while you're still alive. <laughs> All right, next. Bingo, we're done. All right, that's where, that's where we live there. 3017. Oh, yeah, no, we're done. That's my dog, Smedley. Yeah, that was, we're done. <laughs> How long was that? Four hours? Not nearly. <laughs> Good Lord. That was, yeah. Anyway. All right. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate you all hanging out and being here. Thank you. Yeah. Did you want to do some demo here or whatever? Yeah. I'll just throw, I mean, I don't think, man, there are better. YouTube has all kinds of great instructions, so I don't need to do a demo, but if there's any questions, I'll happy to answer. Yeah, you can put your question in the chat and we can help along with that. Or if there are no questions, that's been an hour, right? Hour and 10. Oh, shoot. I wanted to say, uh, you guys sent me a question that Richard Notkin asked about what is success and like, come on, man, I asked you that question. How are you gonna drop that on me? I was asking, cause I didn't know. And Notkin says a lot, he quotes often the, uh, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society, Jiddu Krishnamurti. And I think it's a similar thing, like what is success in such a failed society, right? In such a messed up scene, like, do I really want to be invited to like, you know, hang out with the Kardashians and like, I don't know. So I, I don't know what success is. I mean, I like uh, Emery Douglas, uh, the, is it the minister of art or he was the art guy for the Black Panthers. And I asked him the same question and he was like super, you know, he had this, he did this really generous slideshow and or images and he had made work all over the world with indigenous folks and other people also struggling. And I asked him and he kind of looked, you know, he was like, of course, when my work resonates with the people, like it was just such a gimme. And he was so generous and so like positive. I was like, oh yeah. So I guess like in the, in the context of, you know, what's, is my art successful? I think that is a thing is that it resonates with somebody else. And that's, why, if, you know, people are like, oh, you're so generous, you just give it away. And it's like, no, man, like, I am, I'm trying to get it into the hands of somebody that appreciates it. Like, the commodity aspect of it is, is not interesting to me, but having it, having a, you know, as an object maker, having your work in the hands of somebody that appreciate it. Sorry, that was the other trip is at the show in Los Angeles, there was a gallery guy that showed up. And he was super like into the work and and very kind and invited me to his gallery. And I thought he was kind of like, I didn't, I didn't know if he was being sincere or not, but I went and he like stopped what he was doing, gave me the stack of catalogs from this artist he had and took me into the back. And there was this huge painting and it had human skulls embedded in the painting. And he was like, it kills me that I have this thing here, that it's in the back, that it's not out in somebody's house or in some collection or in a museum but I can't give it away because it will devalue the work and like ruin this artist's career. And it was weird to hear somebody, you know, like a, a commercial gallery guy sound so like impotent or like, you know, just like distressed that he, that, that because of the system, he couldn't, he couldn't share the work the way he wanted. So it made me feel a little more sympathetic to the gallery world, but. <laughs> So there's a question here. Do you use your own cups at home? Yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, they're not the only cups and I'm not sure they're the most popular cups, but yeah. I mean, there's sometimes I'll get sick of them. Um, Marsha has a, my mother-in-law has a nice little collection from each, like they are just cups and I feel like I've been doing the same thing for a long time and Man, if I win the lottery, I'm going to be looking to buy the first 20,000 cups back probably <laughs> to keep them out of there. But, but she has a little collection. So, yeah, we do use them. But and that's the fun thing, too. Uh, I have, you know, as I say, as an artist, like you may never have money, but you'll have a lot of things that money can't buy. And I've traded work with artists and, you know, it's fun to go to shows with artists that you you respect. But man, to be in a show with artists you respect is like, 
another thing. So I have, I have a neat collection of little cups and I have some great tiles by Richard Notkin, who we traded the first time when I was in grad school, or undergrad 20 years ago. I made some little salt and pepper shakers and he sent me some tiles. And that, again, the community is really the thing that keeps me together, right? The folks around the world making cool work and, and they're like my little lighthouses when you know the rest of society seems so messed up and broken. And then to hang out with other artists who are like trying to do things better. Not that, you know, I don't have any anticipation of that, like I'm gonna succeed, but nothing relieves me from my obligation to try. All right. All right, so uh, Adam asks if we can get you to come to the Everson. And I think, you know, that's a promise uh, uh, from my part to work hard on Aaron to get him to come out. But uh, one of the things that I was going to ask Aaron is, you know, you like to, it was amazing. You, you, uh, I've never seen you do um, a really straightforward artist presentation before and there was so much in there and I was so excited to hear you go through all these pro projects but you always say you know I just make cups and I think from a curator's point of view it's a little bit like um, the story of um, Tom Sawyer getting the other kids to like paint the fence for him and convince him like uh, you make all of these cups and you do all of this work but one of the things that I really love as a curator is that um situations adapt themselves and and uh um you challenge the people around you i think to stretch and come up with contacts uh, contexts for your work um can you talk about that sort of innate uh um collaboration which you sort of uh force people's hand which uh you know i appreciate well man but I, i'll say like it's not i'm not I'm not trying to be crafty. I have a beard, but this none of this is my evil genius plan. You know, <laughs> like I really am just kind of staggering and stumbling through the thing. But like, you know, somebody like you who spends so much time looking at work and thinking about work that you think and look at my stuff really means a lot. You know, I don't think most people do. And I mean, I think if you just grab people off the street and you showed them the cups and you showed them a bunch of red solo cups or, you know, the Star Wars collection, you know, from McDonald's, they'd be like, yeah, there's three cups. What, what do you want? You know, so it's, it really is the generation of folks who look at it. Similarly, I think like the, you know, like your service, right? Like the Eagle Globe and Anchor, what does that mean to you? Not the same as it means to me. And like your, your, the sense of service and the Marines, like to civilians, they don't, they don't, they don't understand it in the same way. Not that they don't understand it at all, but you know, it's, it's just not the same. So it really is like, like I really, I'm, I mean, no offense to the Smithsonian, but I kind of got bummed when, when my work got in the Smithsonian, because I was like, man, is my work so impotent and weak that it's already been co-opted by the state? Like this sucks. <laughs> like, and those cups are dead. You know, they're in the, they're in a they're in a box someplace next to the Holy Grail and Rosebud, and and they're they're dead. The story's over. You know, like the cups that are in somebody's hand. You know, the the homeless guy or whoever that has the cup. Those stories are, and I don't know that there's any real, you know, science behind it, but like there is, I feel like those cups are growing in strength, that those cups are, you know, their stories are still growing, where the cups in a box, you know, in a white gallery are, are dead. I gotta say a joke too about the the Nelson Atkins and the cup. I was, I forget the show that you put me in there first, but like, there were so many like heavy, it was, that was a 3D thing. It, you guys had the, I couldn't make it to the opening, but you had a 3D uh, experience, like a virtual thing. That was the first one I'd ever been in. So like I put them on, I woke my wife up. I, hey, Sarah, check this out. You can see my work at, at the Everson. And she was sleeping. So she's in the bedroom there. And she put, she put these 3D goggles on. She was butt naked, but all of a sudden she's like standing in the middle of the gallery at the Everson. And, ah! and she threw them down. But then the other, so in that show, uh, I don't know who it was at the museum, but they called me and they're like, hey, uh, you know, we're calling to arrange shipment of returning your work. And I was like, oh no, no, no. I, I thought that was clear that I meant you guys to keep the cups. And she's like, what, we can keep them? 
oh great click <laughs> <laughs> so so i think there were 13 cups in this in that show and the <laughs> so i don't know that the four that are in this show are the best <laughs> like, i, I select i hand selected them oh, okay, uh, from okay. the 13 they are absolutely all right, all right. the best and curator approved Aaron. okay okay great so uh, I, I love that Really great question that I, I guess I've always uh, wondered too, Aaron. Uh, Linda Fitzgibbon uh, asks about um, repetitive uh, muscle strains and uh, uh, if you've had any issues with your tendonitis and uh, carpal tunnels and what you do to safeguard yourself. Uh, yeah, I just, I don't know. Yeah, things hurt, but you know, I'm a hundred pounds overweight. I, I like, I broke both bones in this arm, broke this thumb, both wrists a few times before, or I guess in addition to doing this stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, it just feels like it's inevitable. Like, you know, there's going to be something. Now that weed's legal, though, the CBD stuff, that, that actually does help quite a bit with the joints. And I don't know. I mean, it's aging. I mean, that's a deal. I'm just going to keep working as long as I can. And, Yeah, I don't know. I think, yeah, uh, I was saying, I think my belly kind of is like back support, maybe. But whatever, I've lost like 40 pounds <laughs> in the last couple of months. So I've been losing two or three pounds a week. So that's the goal until I lose 100 pounds. <laughs> I thought, you know, fat was just an aesthetic thing, but it, Doc says no, there's other consequences. So I'd like to stay around, maybe make another. 20,000 cups or so. So I'm trying to take better care. And actually, um, my first instructor, Phil Cornelius, there, he talked about, and that was one of the things that kind of clicked too, is in the Marine Corps, they talk about uh, bone support and, and uh, you know, like not muscling the weapon. But he, he was talking also with like, instead of using this when you're throwing, instead of using this part of your hand to use this, right? So you're not stressing the joint, but you're, you're using, you know, it's just the whole bone. That you're pushing so i have been and in like a basic welding book they were talking about like before you start the weld you know make sure you're comfortable and so i have been trying to like be good about not messing up the joints but there is some pain aaron i don't think you mentioned it during the talk can you tell us about the symbolism of the base of each cup and the way that you finish off the base of each cup I don't know about the symbolism, but it's just, you know, I don't want to trim all the cups. They're a little bottom heavy. I like somebody a couple of months ago was like, when did you become a master potter? And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm not a master potter. I'm still working on it. But yeah, especially in the beginning, and I, in the beginning, I thought I had to throw them pretty thick so that I could use the sprig molds without tearing the clay. So they'd be pretty bottom heavy. So I was using the, uh, the sandbags, the little green army men, a mold of that to compress the bottom and kind of thin it out. But, and that's the thing too, right? Like uh, the cups, they're kind of the shape that they flare out like that and are narrow at the bottom. And that is just because they feel better in my hand that way. And I'm less likely to drop them if I'm eating wings or something, you know, like, and, uh, and but there's a, I guess there's a tradition. There's a thing called a watch cup that's almost identical and it's a navy thing they don't have handles but they used to the, give them to the guys that were on deck when it was cold they give them coffee and these thick porcelain cups with that same shape that they could hold while they were on watch and yeah so we're gonna have to wrap up here aaron but i want to ask yeah. one final question and uh omar is also posting make sure that you see the link in the chat that Omar has um, uh, posted for the choreo poem that's going to be streamed tonight for Veterans Voices. Um, there is a link and you can still register for that. Um, so the final question that I have, Aaron, is about the constant cycle of um, imagery that makes its way onto your pot. Having spent time with you, um, people come up to you and give you medals and photocopies and um, memorabilia and images that find their way into your cup can and it's great seeing your studio which is the space where all of these things wind up can you talk a little bit about 
that process of kind of uh, receiving and the reciprocal relationship with the people who um, receive your cups eventually. Yeah, I mean, so it, again, it started, it was my, my, my insignia, right? Like my Eve Globe and Anchor, my father's cap insignia. Um, and this is the, the GI Joe gas mask that I wore in the Gulf War. So it started with my own stuff, but then as I've gone on, met other folks. And I insisted in the beginning on only using images or insignia that somebody themselves rated, not the children of or anything. But after France, and they had all this insane insignia from World War I, it was their children or grandchildren that were letting me. But, but yeah, I make the, make the mold of the insignia. I keep, they get the cup and I keep the mold. And so I, they just kind of grow, which is... Sometimes I feel like that guy in Clockwork Orange, you know, with his eyes wide open, like, because it is like they'll see some documentary and they'll just email me cold and tell me about a, a suicide, like a, a guy went to Annapolis and his buddy was, he said, one of the greatest leaders he'd ever met in his life, Navy SEAL, and he died in Afghanistan and he sent me that cup, you know, but it's like, I was packing cups the other day. I never met the guy, but I'm packing. The brother had like five siblings and I was making cups for him. And I made the cups and put them in the mail. I was just sobbing, <laughs> like, you know, so, you know, but I mean, like those people can't turn away, right? Those vets can't turn away. Those families can't, can't turn away. So why should I like, oh, well, you know, and that's again, like that thing of being part of the community. Like I'm never not going to be a vet and it's never going to like, you know, I can't just, oh, you know, I'm over. Yeah. Omar's over being black now. He's just, he's, we're going to do something else now. <laughs> it's not a thing. So, so, you know, and, I, and in the end, like it's hard sometimes, but I really, it does feel good having that connection. And, and, and what it, a bartender from Ireland said, a burden shared is a burden halved. And I don't know that it's true, but it is nice sometimes to get it out, you know, to like verbalize it and have it out in the world instead of just, you know, like I said, I didn't understand my father, my grandfather, they didn't talk about their wars until I came back from mine and I was a little upset. And then Arjun, my son, he's like, dad, how come you were bad and now you're good? And I, what? And I just started crying. You know, he said, you were a soldier, right? I was like, oh, <laughs> so let's watch SpongeBob. But but so, you know, so it feels easier if you've been through those things. And it goes on with like sexual trauma or racism and, you know, all these other things, suicide, you know, like it's all hard to talk about. It's not polite, you know, people don't like you at the party, you know, if you're going to bring that crap up. So, so, but I feel like that's, you know, again, that's the hope that the cups can be the touchstone to have these conversations about unspeakable things, you know, and and feel open enough to share their stories you know it's a real it means a lot to me when people will share that stuff with me it's not easy but it's not easy for them either and i would i'd rather they share it than not so blah blah thanks for your time everybody uh, so uh aaron and omar thank you so much kimberly thank you for uh um running all of this come visit us and see the exhibition who what where when it features aaron alongside art artists like jean michel basquiat and Carrie Mae Weems, <laughs> artists cool, yeah. who document their truth and it's and uh, speak truth to power. Um, and I can also say that the Everson is working on a cafe project where you can come into the Everson's cafe and uh, choose the cup that you drink out of. And I promise that there will be Aaron Tool cups in the mix. And so you can see cups in our collection, but we are going to find ways for people to actually interact and keep using your work as well. Right on. All right. Thanks, Be everybody. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Aaron and Omar and Garth. Thank Have a good you. night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Strength.